Hi everyone, this is Balash from Racing Brick. Yes, finally the day has come. I can hardly believe it. After all the teasers and the long weeks of waiting, I can now show you the LEGO Technic Leaper LR13000. Was it worth the wait? Well, one way or another, it's sure going to be one hell of a show. First, let's take a quick look at this massive box and then I promise I will open it right up. The format is a bit odd, I think it is made for the TikTok generation, it is easier to shoot it vertically with your phone. We have the crane on the front, some technical drawings and the included electronic components on the side, another view on the back showing the functions and a close-up on the other side. The set has 2883 pieces, which is still hard to believe, especially considering that the massive price tag is at the other end of the spectrum. Ok, so this is a surprise, what do we have here? That's an interesting box, and here's another one, and another one. Ok, we had a big stack of boxes in there. So, one big box with the crane design, I guess there's the bags in there, this one with the electronic components and the weights, then the standard frames and the gear racks, then the new A-frame and the longer ones, and here's the new frame design, I really like this separation of parts. Oh, and these aren't glued at all and only have the parts without extra bags, at least most of the parts, the packaging is quite interesting. Here are the hubs, the motors and the new weights, which we'll take a closer look at later. Now comes the big box. This contains the classic plastic bags that LEGO has yet to get rid of in this set. There are 20 numbered bags with 5 building phases, but the distribution is pretty uneven. There are 7 bags for phase 2, for example. Here is the envelope with the instructions and the sticker sheet. I'm glad to see the numbers on the instructions that was missing from the first generation with the new white design. Now all that is left is to add the set number back again and we will be good. At the beginning of the manual there is an introduction to the model with some photos of the truly gigantic real version. There is an interesting section in the text that says the largest ever LEGO Technic model in all dimensional measurements. Well, Big Red is the same height, the cat bulldozer is definitely wider, I'm not sure about the length but we will be sure to do some comparisons when it is finished. Here is the real life LR13000 with some very impressive data, but otherwise, surprisingly, it doesn't really look like our LEGO model. We will come back to that as well. Here are some instructions for the app and the page showing what we can expect to control with it. An interesting new page that tells you to update the firmware on the hubs before you install them in the model, it's a great advice. Here is the first step in the profile, you need to connect both hubs and they will be updated. Here is the parts list with only 3 pages, the same as the Corvette, now it is time to start building. This is the first assembly with the first motor. By the way, the resistance of this motor is surprisingly high, I can hardly turn these gears. We add 2 structures on the sides, they use the 3x19 Technic frame, which is new in yellow after the black and green version. We have a large double gear rack ring with black and yellow pieces. That middle 10 axle could have moved before, but this structure here will prevent that in the future. Here is the ring that comes between the gear racks, and interestingly, it has a different structure than, for example, the rough terrain crane. That one had 8 symmetrical segments, while this one has 4 sections but the two segments aren't identical. On one side, the slightly longer 5.5 module long axles were used, and on the other, those with 5 modules, so we can expect the final result to be slightly asymmetrical, but apparently everything is fine when we put it in place. Here the second ring has been added, and this is the end of phase 1. The next phase begins with the track rollers, and here's an interesting challenge. This dog bone piece is new in dark bleach grey, and at first glance it may not be obvious how to put it in place. Fortunately, it's not unsolvable. Here you can see the complete assembly with all the rollers, and we can already see the expected size. But not quite, because the assemblies with the larger sprocket wheels are still needed at the end. Here is a cool trick with the design of the wheel hub, who would have thought that the cross axle with stuff fits perfectly there. That's the whole block with the motor and don't even think about turning the sprocket wheel by hand, with the wheel hub and the gearing the motor turns about 15 times faster than the sprocket wheel itself. Interestingly, the central cross axle with stop is already added, which means that pushing the side panels in place at a certain angle might be uncomfortable. The other two axles are inserted only afterwards. The tracks are mounted, time to install the first hub. The cables aren't color coded this time, but the arrangement can be more or less seen in the instructions. We need to run step 2 of the preparation in the app, the hub is connected, then we can test the functionality of the motors. I assume that the controls will be the same in the final profile, but the rest is still hidden. We can rotate the turntable and then we need to align the black frame to the hub. We can also test the tracks individually, and then drive the base around to see how it works. 
At this point, it is surprisingly maneuverable. We will see how it performs when everything is installed. This is the base of the superstructure, quite a large assembly. This is what our crane looks like at the moment. This socket and ball combination has only been available in the Spike Prime sets and the socket was medium as well. This is how the weight support will roll on the ground. This interesting mechanism with the gear rack and the rubber bands will act as a load sensor when the second hub is in place. Here is the hub, all three motors are connected, this time we get some color coding to make sure everything is connected to the correct port. This is what our build looks like at the end of the first book. The second book starts with this assembly and then we can finally check the new lattice frame pieces. So here are the new elements, two of them are brand new, the third one we could already see on the John Deere skidder. As you can see the width and structure of these parts is quite different, only the length is the same. There are various pin and axle hole connections, this is how they are connected, the narrower elements are shifted with one module. Alignment of the parts is important as emphasized in the instructions so pay attention to that. It is time to attach the Derrick Booms heel section to the superstructure. You may know these two huge shock absorbers from the BMW motorcycle set. I won't lie, building the lattice boom sections is pretty repetitive. I need to attach these pendants, the first is used for the load detection system, the second for the counterweight. Now it is time to build the main boom. The structure is very similar to the previous ones, it's really not the most exciting part of the build. So the two main booms are built, now comes the real challenge, cable management. As you can see, this set is no joke. We first use the 3.5 meter cable, but there's also a 2 meter and a whopping 6.5 meter long one as well. This is the part where you really have to pay close attention. I didn't film it because I needed all my hands and even an extra pair. This is the third checkpoint in the app. You have to make sure the spool is empty because the winding is done by the app. After that, it's time to assemble the jib masts and attach them to the boom. Lots of pendants and connections everywhere, you really have to pay attention, this one for example is in a wrong position, now it is corrected. A few more frame parts for the jib, and then comes the force checkpoint where we can already test the boom and jib movement. Now it is time to cover the superstructure on all sides, also at the cabin, and finish the look with some system elements. This is the hook assembly, it doesn't have any new or special parts, but it's still pretty big. Here are the brand new counterweights. Each of them weighs 45 grams according to my not so scientific kitchen scale, we have 24 of them and the surface looks pretty rough. All the pieces look like this, so the marks should be from the manufacturing process, they don't look very nice to be honest. Now we just have to add the counterweights and the construction is finished. This thing looks absolutely massive when it's done. Honestly, even at this size, I don't know how it's going to fit in an average room and everyone says it's too small. Well, LEGO probably didn't choose the correct model number. Anyway, it's time for calibration. The process takes about a minute. I had to rearrange my photo table and lights to be able to film the entire crane there. Just to give you an idea of the size of this thing. Oh, that's me, hello. The table is 75 centimeters high, which is about 30 inches, and I am 180 centimeters tall, which is about 5.9 feet. At the end point, the crane looks suspiciously taller than me, but I will measure it in a minute. The official maximum height is 100 cm, which is about 38 inches, while this is a 110.7 cm, which is about 43.5 inches. Why did LEGO give us a smaller number? I have no idea. Now let me show you how the app controls work, but first a quick disclaimer. This is a beta version of the app, which means things may change in the final version. Parameters, especially weight limits, might be updated, so anything you see here is still subject to change and my opinion is based on the current beta state of the app. We have two sliders at the bottom that allow us to control each track independently. As you can see, the movement is a bit choppy, I think I built everything correctly, but please check it with other reviewers. The slider in the upper left corner controls the superstructure rotation, this one is surprisingly fast. I would have preferred it slower, you can see that even without any load, the momentum of the superstructure rotates the tracks. This one on the right is the control for the hook, it goes up and down, that's all. And this other joystick controls the boom and the jib. If we tap this button at the bottom, we can also control them visually, which is a very nice feature, I've seen this last time in the profile of the Leaper Excavator. And what does this button do here? Yes, after all these years they finally made it, we can switch the left and right joysticks. I really don't want to seem ungrateful, thank you dear developers, but a crane might not be the set where this is a top priority. Please, please implement this for the cars that are still available, it is way more important for them. 
The other button on the right shows us different screens. We can see the rotation of the superstructure plus the center of gravity. This one has presets for the boom and the jib. And this one here gives us some statistics. And now it's time to do a lifting test. This empty container from the max set weighs 379 grams. Let's try to lift it. As you can see, the load level is really minimal, it's barely visible. When I try to extend the boom to increase the load, the indicator turns orange. According to the display, that's about 60-70% of the maximum load capacity. What I find odd though is that with this amount of load, the entire superstructure visibly leans forward. If I look closer, I can stick my finger under the support. Apparently the tilt of the whole superstructure is calculated in the safety measures, because according to LEGO, the crane is currently working the way it's designed. If I manually pull the load indicator to its maximum position, that's nowhere near the full capacity, so the bending is really calculated in, I find this weird. Let's see what happens when an irresponsible child or adult starts playing with the load, then you will see how much this relatively small weight stresses the system. Don't get me wrong, it holds up well, but it's a little scary to watch. And now let's see what happens with exactly 1 kilogram of weight, which is 2.2 pounds. Okay, that immediately went to red, and you can see the insane tilt of the build. I can almost put two fingers under the support here, that doesn't look good at all. I didn't show you yet the two buttons in the upper right corner. The first one locks the movements, so they are continuous and the joysticks don't go back to zero, and the second one is the safety function. When it is activated and you reach the red area, the boom and jeep can't be extended any further. But what happens when you turn it off? Well, this happens, and it's very very painful to watch. The motors are apparently strong enough and honestly the whole system holds up pretty well, everything is robust enough to withstand those maneuvers, really well done, but I'm not sure anyone will feel comfortable watching this after paying 700 bucks for this thing. As I mentioned earlier, this is a beta version of the app, the limits could still change, but I can't shake the feeling that more counterweight would be needed to make the crane behave like a real crane, and not as an episode of a heavy machinery fail compilation video. So folks, this video has been long enough, I will stop here for today. You could see the build, the end result, and how the crane behaves. We could already draw a conclusion based on this, but I still have much more to show you in the next video. So far, without getting into the price, I would say that the look is very impressive, at least for people who don't know much about cranes, that the building process is fine but repetitive and frustrating in places, and that the app works well. But there are plenty of question marks if you know what an LR13000 is supposed to look like, I personally have serious concern about the lazy limits in the app, and we haven't even talked about that price tag yet. For the next video I have quite a few sets to compare, their size, weight, range, I also prepared some interesting calculations for the price, so get ready for another interesting episode. We will also check if it was a good idea to call this model LR13000 at all, and of course I will share my summary and final opinion as well. Also, please let me know if you'd like to see any specific details of the set, or you want me to perform some tasks that don't require me to build something big. I will include them in the second video if possible. If you watch this video after the set is released, you will find the link to the second part at the end so you can continue watching my adventures with the beast. If you enjoyed this video then please give it a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe with notifications as more exciting LEGO videos are coming soon. See you next time, bye bye.